Hello there. Today I'm delighted to be tasting um, a really interesting wine. This is Ao Yun. And Ao Yun is from China. Specifically, it's from Yunnan, um, from the Shangri La region at the bottom of the Himalayas. So we're in southwest China, near the border with Myanmar and Laos. And uh, as I say, this is made by uh, Louis Vuitton Mo Hennessy, LVMH, the luxury goods group. We have to thank them for sending us a bottle to taste. Um, this is the second most expensive wine to come out of China, so um, I'm hoping for something really interesting here. It's a relatively new project. Um, Ao Yun was uh, developed after um, an Australian winemaker and viticulturist, um, Dr. Tony Jordan spent four years researching terroirs in China to try and find an ideal site to make a wine of Grand Cru standard in China for, for Louis Vuitton and Hennessy. Um, and he'd been working for them in Australia and New Zealand and um, as I say, spent four years researching the terroirs. And what he eventually found were, um, our Yun is, is now made um, from 314 plots of vines um, spread across four villages I think they're about 40 hectares in, in all making this. Um, and each of these plots is harvested separately and vinified separately. And sometimes they're, they're so uh, meticulous that they'll actually do two or three passes through each of these vineyards to establish this. And, uh, so you've got a wide diversity of terroirs. You have quite high altitude, which adds some interesting aspects to the winemaking and to the way the grapes grow. Uh, so th these are vineyards between something like about 2,200 and 2,800 metres above sea level in the foothills of the Himalayas. So one of the things that this does evidently is, is that you end up with greater UV light um, in, the, in the sunlight and, and therefore it encourages the grapes to grow thicker skins. So you should expect a wine with good structure and tannin. The blend here is, is it, I would guess it, you'd say it was a reasonably typical Bordeaux type blend with a couple of exceptions. 74% Cabernet Sauvignon in 2016, which is what we have here, uh, with 20% of Cabernet Franc, 4% um, of Syrah, so not completely a Bordeaux blend, um, and 2% of Petit Verdot. I understand that in 2018, they started putting some Merlot into the blend, but for the moment, there's no Merlot here. Another thing that um, was a change in 2016 was that this was the first vintage. They decided if they tasted the wines and blended them at the winery, the altitude actually had an effect on the taste of the wine, and therefore this wine was, was blended in Hong Kong, and I believe subsequent vintages have been, so down at sea level, so you don't get the, the effect of altitude there. The other effect that altitude has is that um, during maceration, fermentation, the um, fruit and the must needed exposure to more oxygen to enable that to go ahead because the oxygen is quite um, thin at these sort of altitudes. So, um, for instance, malolactic conversion was, was done in earthenware jars and in new oak barrels to allow greater oxygen ingress to encourage that. Also in 2016, there's been a slight um, a dialing back on the amount of new oak being used. So in, instead of being aged in 100% new oak, this was aged in a combination of new and first fill oak, one year old oak. Um, but still, I'm expecting quite a structured wine from this. So let's have a look at it and see what we make of it. I mean, this is this has a, a, an intense dark ruby red colour, almost sort of inky depth to the core. I can just make out the stem of the glass through it as I, as I look through. Swirling it, there's a certain amount of staining to the to the glass, a slight bit. Um, there seems to be a, a formation of some, oh yes indeed, a formation of some tears there. The wine has 14.5% alcohol, so um, that combined with what I'm expecting are going to be fairly um, bountiful tannins should um, give a degree of weight there. So let's talk about the aroma, shall we? Let's see what we've got there. It 
slightly masked by um, a more rich, um, ripe mulberry note, but actually there's a fresh black currant cassis note that really um, is uh, is consistent throughout the aromas here. On the verge. There are well integrated notes of oak. There's a sort of a graphite and cedar note. People talk about lead pencils or a combination of those two, but that sort of those notes are there. And yet there is that sort of rich, almost slightly jammy mulberry note um, of ripe, intense fruit over the top of all that. So yeah, good complexity, good intensity. So let's have a taste. The wine has some really lovely freshness. And you know, it's a relatively warm area to be growing grapes. But you have a combination of the altitude cooling, um, the growing conditions, and also the influence of the Indian Ocean adding a moderating um, element to the climate. So, as I said, lovely freshness, but there's good structure, there's good weight. Um, there is a sort of a, an intense red currency note, and then that's supported by very fine cedary tannins, and I do mean very fine. They're, um, plentiful. There's a there's a sort of a suppleness to them, but they've still got that sort of slightly bitter bite. There's a tiny touch of sort of salty um, aspect to the the finish. There's a slightly saline note, um, adding a sort of a smoothness, slightly closing up the fruit. But in general, the weight and roundness. This is a a medium to medium full-bodied wine. There's, there's, there's plenty of richness in fact, it's medium full-bodied. Um, the richness and the roundness, the alcohol's rounding it out there. Um, and the finish is sort of rounded. There's a um, cedar and mulberry note. You might say there's a slight meatiness and just the beginnings of a little bit of development, sort of in terms of um, a slight sort of forest floor dried leaves sort of note, but those are only very slight notes right at the back. More um, noticeable is this intense, rich mulberry fruit that has taken over from the sort of red currant fruit that you got with the initial um, rush of acidity there. The alcohol is leaving a warmth and a roundness and a richness to the finish. It's, it's not a sort of a, an elegant, long, perfumed red fruit finish. It's much more rounded and rich. You're starting to sort of see almost notes of rich uh, licorice. Um, there are slightly drying notes of sort of coffee. Uh, again, those sort of cedary, um, cedary notes. The, the smoothness, the finesse of the tannin is actually making me think of uh, bitter dark chocolate. That sort of um, both texturally and flavour wise. The flavours are lasting well. Um, I mean, this is a a wine that at 2016 is probably um, destined for another 10 to 15 years worth of ageing and, and it has the intensity, it has the freshness to do that. Um, having said that, it's actually surprisingly um, accessible now. I, I would imagine that you would gain a lot from ageing it for at least another five or six years and probably longer. Um, you know, the, the, the tannins do have a rich, round smoothness that they finish with, despite having had plenty of bite at the beginning. I, I think that's a really nicely made wine. I, I think it's it's structurally very together. It's certainly not cheap, um, but uh, with the expressed aim of making a wine of class growth quality from the um, foothills of the Himalayas, I think um, it's fair to say that our yuan certainly seem to have done that. Um, so thank you very much for watching, I hope you found this interesting, um, I've certainly enjoyed uh, tasting and talking about our Yun. I hope if you enjoyed the video you'll like and share with your friends, um, I hope you'll leave comments. And also um, please do follow us on, on YouTube and um, we hope very much that you'll be able to join us again for another tasting very soon. Thank you very much, bye now.